Good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a new weekly political agenda. Tonight, we will discuss the outcome of the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring is a term for the revolutionary wave of demonstration and protest, both nonviolent and violent, and also riots. Related events in the Arab world included uprising in some countries, which led to violence and affected the interim governments. However, most Arab states are suffering from unrest and instability due to demonstrations, explosions, clashes, violence, actions, or even sectarian conflicts. Seeking solutions is a must bet to help solving such a crisis. Let's take a look at this report and we'll come back for further discussions. However, mostly Arab states are suffering from unrest and instability. Seeking solution is a must be to help them in their crisis. In a time, Syria is suffering since the war has started in 2011. More than 100,000 people have died and millions more, including one million children, have fled their homes, where they face hardship while awaiting their fate in sprawling refugee camps. Finally, the Syrian opposition agreed on joining Geneva too after the National Coalition for Syrian Revolutionary and Opposition Forces have formed the interim government headed by Ahmed Toaima. With no doubt, we have confidence in this government. And you decide for this government to be a working one. Not only to deliver speeches and send inapplicable messages, it's the first free government in Syria. The priority of my government will be to restore stability in the liberated areas, improve their living conditions, and provide security. Continuing to put an end to serious crisis, the Kuwait summit kicked off to put a specific address of the tragic situation in Syria and to call on the United Nations Peace and Security Council to carry out its responsibilities by agreeing on a plan to end the fighting in the country, referring to the Second Geneva Conference as an historic opportunity to reach a political solution. Tripoli wasn't far from what's happening in the region. It has been thrust ever deeper into violence this weekend, as a peaceful demonstration turned Ari on Friday afternoon, and an armed group opened fire on protesters, killing dozens, injuring hundreds, and sparking armed clashes across and beyond the city. I don't agree on the government performance, and I'm not here just to tell justifications. I'm saying a truth quite well known by all of us. If there's a weakness, this is due to the weakness in the state itself. And if you want to get rid of armed groups, we must find a solution for these individuals. Continuing the series of unrest in the region, the violence track and the armed actions escalated in Sana'a, by the armed militias that linked with Al-Qaeda, home pledged in a statement to punish Houthi's group. Meantime, the tension prevailed on the capital and the other cities thousand north of Yemen. Al-Qaeda threatens all of us, not only Houthis, but also all political powers. And because it's a terrorist organization, and they don't fear from being a terrorist organization, Houthi's movement also is an armed group, and we as citizens and as members in the dialogue, we reject to possessing weapons in the hands of any organization. It must to be in the hands of the state, not others. In the same context, dozens of dead bodies found in different parts of the capital of Baghdad, as doubts headed toward the security forces after a wave of random arrests carried out during the past few days. A number of mosques were closed as a result of repeated attacks with sectarian dimensions. The issue of closing mosques, in my opinion, is incorrect. Today, the mosque is the place that brings people and teaches them a lot of good morality and tolerance. Today, the language of forgiveness that spread through the mosques helping much to heal the wounds of this province. Violence, clashes, unrest, demonstrations, and protesting, different actions for only one result, People are dying, suffering, and couldn't resist even to live. For a political agenda, this is Mirihan Abdel Majid.
Welcome back. Thank you, Meriham, for this report. Allow me to introduce my panelists from the studio. With me, Dr. Abdul Aziz Al Awaishig, Assistant Secretary General for the GCC countries. From Kuwait, Dr. Aid Al Manna, an academic and media advisor. Last but not the least, from Cairo, Professor Abdullah Schleifer, Professor of and Political Analyst and Professor at AUC. Thank you all for joining me. And let's start tonight. I would like from you guests shorter questions because we're discussing many countries. We're discussing Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and Libya. Starting with Iraq, violence has seen a hike in the last few months amid security and political flopping, contradictory statements of the leaders to impose new plans more successful to protect the citizens has not been successful in convincing people to the possibility of security system and preventing the increase in violence. Dr. Abdelaziz al Awashik, allow me first of all uh, to welcome you to the program and start the outcome of the Arab Spring. But let's go to the first country that has witnessed the changes, right, which is Iraq right. in 2003, right. after the ousting of uh, Saddam Hussein. Since then, for the past 10 years, Iraq has not really rise again. Uh, in your point of view, how do you read the situation in Iraq and the latest developments? Well, uh, 2013 has been the worst in Iraq yes. so far, mm -hmm. since 2008. There was a, a lull in the violence for a while, but now we see a resurgence of violence. Car bombings alone are happening now at the average of two a day or more. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of it has to do with the way the, uh, the Iraqi government, the Prime Minister al-Maliki, mm -hmm. has handled the popular demands by people, especially in Sunni-dominated areas, mm -hmm. but not only there. I mean, we saw in May, for example, of this year, the way the security forces dealt with uh, peaceful demonstrators in, Un in Anbar, Hawaja, and other places. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of people were either killed or, or wounded. Uh, and I think that helped Al-Qaeda, helped terrorist groups in Iraq because ordinary Iraqis ha hasn't seen, first, their demands ignored, and second, mm. their, uh, uh, the, the heavy-handed manner in which security forces have dealt with them. Uh, some of them, uh, I think, tolerated the presence of Al-Qaeda, and we see now mm -hmm. Al-Qaeda is reestablishing itself in Iraq, uh, much stronger than it, it has been since 2008. Uh, you probably saw the letter that six influential senators sent to President Obama during al-Maliki's visit to Washington. Mm -hmm. And I think they pointed out to some of the problems that mm -hmm. started with the prime minister himself mm -hmm. and the government of Iraq. Uh, first, uh, w what we mentioned about the way it treated popular demands, peaceful protests in the Sunni-dominated areas, mm -hmm. but also the way it dealt with uh, Shia leaders, with Kurdish leaders, and with Sunni leaders. Mm. Uh, the Iraqi prime minister, before and after he came back from Washington, almost always uh, lumped uh, all Sunni leaders and terrorists and Al-Qaeda all in the same sentence, mm -hmm. implying mm -hmm. that they are all the same. And I think that has not been very helpful. I mean, keep in mind that uh, al-Maliki, I think, mm. has is fixated on 2014, what is going to be where we will, Iraq will have the par parliamentary elections, mm -hmm. and he hoped to have yet another term, uh, despite attempts to block him from running again, but he's still hopeful he would do that. And, and it seems the way he's doing it is by consolidating his power, mm -hmm. marginalizing all his opponents, all his rivals, mm -hmm. and in the process, helping Iran uh, mm get its, w the, the, its agenda, whether it's in Syria or in Iraq itself. Mm -hmm. uh, the Iraqi government has been looking the other way as Iraqi, Iranian planes uh, loaded with weapons have crossed uh, Iraqi skies to, uh, to Syria. To Syria yes. Fighters from Iraq have been fighting in Syria and the Iraqi government mm -hmm. has not really tried to prevent them. Uh, while it's making uh, the noises. The state of Iraq and the state of Sham and the state of Iraq. No, I'm not talking about the, uh, the Sunni uh, groups. groups, but also the, uh, the groups that claim to be uh, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. going, to going to Syria to protect the Shia the regime, oh, like the Al-Fadl ibn al-Abbas <coughs> and <coughs> others. Mm -hmm. uh, th these are Shia terrorist groups, and so the Iraqi government, while they're making noises about uh, Al-Qaeda 
and its affiliated groups is, is doing very little to prevent Iraqi fighters, and Iraqi weapons, and Iranian weapons and Iranian fighters from crossing its borders to go to Syria. Okay. Dr. Aid, uh, sir, now you're neighboring to Iraq. Kuwait is uh, a neighbor to Iraq. And uh, if, if, if we are to ask about the latest developments in, uh, in Iraq, uh, how do you read it? The, the, the explosions uh, and the tensions are uh, rising up, the sectarianism in Iraq. How do you see Iraq right now? And is it going to, you know, to become healthy or as uh, a neighbor and uh, a media consultant, how, wh what's your advice to Iraq and what's the situation? How do you read the development, sir? Thank you very much. Uh, well, Iraq, as uh, any of its neighbors and other Arab countries, unfortunately, the democracy come to Iraq if there is a kind of democracy without preparing the ground for such a democracy. Uh, I can say it is not a, a, a democratic role. It is a kind of uh, multi parties uh, government uh, from different groups, uh, mostly those who actually have their uh, Islamist or religious agenda. <coughs> The, the fighting now, and the fighting, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, after the American invasion to Iraq, uh, it was uh, at that time uh, covered by a, a national theme uh, to, to fight the Americans. But in, in, uh, in reality, uh, it, it is a, 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 a sectarian strife. Mm -hmm. Shia against Sunni, Sunni against Shia. Uh, to be honest, I think uh, the Sunni felt that uh, they lost the power uh, 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 by uh, uh, the collapsing of Saddam Hussein uh, government, uh, and therefore they they start fighting mm -hmm. at the pretext that they are fighting the Americans, but. In reality, they are fighting each other. They are fighting the, the other uh, part of the Iraqis who are the Shia. At the same time, those who came to power and who actually been qualified by the Americans, by the way, they are the, 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 the friends and alliance of Iran. Mm -hmm. and, and they actually, they have their own agenda uh, unfortunately, also that the Arab, they uh, and especially us in the in the Gulf, uh, do not extend hand to those who ruled Iraq after Saddam Hussein. Mm. Uh, we we kept uh, a distance from them, mm -hmm. and that encouraged Iran to go through in deep of the Iraq, and they relied on Iraq. And we noticed that when uh, uh, Iyad Alawi. Uh, 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 won the majority in mm -hmm. the parliament. Won the elections. Yes. Uh, he couldn't form. He, he couldn't form the government because the pressure of Iran, who act, who actually pressurized <coughs> all the Shia groups uh, to affiliate with Al Maliki, mm -hmm. and that what happened. He became the prime minister. Mm -hmm. I personally know that Al Maliki really want to have uh, a government. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, a reconciliation with the other parties. But to be honest, the other parties, especially those who are in the Al Ambar and in the north, mm -hmm. they don't want any kind of rec reconciliation. They also rely on other parties or in the uh, other parties in the Arab regions mm -hmm. uh, to overthrow Al Maliki by creating this kind of chaos in Iraq. Mm. And I think by uh, mentioning the, the word chaos, this is in, in Iraq or in other Arab countries, mm. that what the terminology uh, had been described by Condoleezza Rice, mm. that's the creative chaos. Mm. Now we are living the created, 
the creative we are living the chaos whether mm. it will be a creative or a disaster god knows <laughs> <clears throat> Professor Abdullah Schleifer said, uh, Dr. Abdelaziz Al-Awashik said a while ago that 2013 is becoming or is one of the bloodiest years of Iraq and the tensions or even the clashes are starting and even they are exporting their troubles to the surrounding countries such as Syria and Lebanon. How do you read the developments in Iraq, sir, and what's the solution for Iraq in your point of view? Well, I think the problem predates the Arab Spring, which, as my colleagues have said, has really turned into uh, Arab turmoil wherever uh, the Arab Spring broke out and mm. widespread. The one exception to that is Egypt. Uh, we had turmoil here, but we're now stabilizing mm. uh, because of the intervention of the army and the creation of a transitional government. Mm. Um, we, we, too, ha here in Egypt, uh, were suffering from um, uh, extraordinary chaos over the past year or so. Mm. But as far as Iraq goes, I think you have to see it predates the Arab Spring. And that is initially um, oh, when fighting intensified uh, after the American uh, invasion of Iraq and, and, and started as a resistance movement among the Sunnis, um, Al-Qaeda moved in and took advantage of that, and a lot of the um, uh, Sunni armed elements uh, uh, supported them. Mm. And then there was a very significant uh, development, which was uh, the, the United States, uh, besides sending more troops in for a surge, which really didn't do anything much, mm. what was significant was they reached out to Arab Sunni tribes uh, who were already feeling uncomfortable with the presence of Al-Qaeda, because Al-Qaeda once it's installed, you know, becomes uh, very severe mm -hmm. and uh, commits its own outrages on the local population, which initially was sympathetic to them. And so you had the awakening movement, mm -hmm. where Iraqi Sunnis turned against Al-Qaeda and fought them, and, and the Americans supported it and gave them funding and arms. Now, when the um, United States pulled out, um, the understanding was that the Iraqi, the Baghdad government, the Maliki government was supposed to reconcile with, these, uh, with these, uh, this awakening movement, this Iraqi Sunni movement which had become anti-Qaeda, had turned against Al-Qaeda. And they were supposed to integrate them into the security forces and to the army and security forces. And by and large, they did not. And so the security forces, although they represent the, uh, they, 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 they fly the flag of the Iraqi army and the Iraqi security forces mm -hmm. are a predominantly Shia force which acts on, 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 on that behalf. And, and effectively, you could say that the awakening movement was betrayed. Mm -hmm. um, they, ha they had this understanding and it didn't come to pass. And so what's happened now is, and I would fault, it, I would fault the um, al-Maliki and his regime, that what has happened now is al-Qaeda has having a second breath, a second chance, mm -hmm. and again rallying elements from the Iraqi Sunni community who are not intrinsically al-Qaeda, but feel, as I said, betrayed because mm -hmm. of the arrangement that the Americans had promised and it fell through. Mm -hmm. And so I think the only answer is, um, uh, but I don't, who's around, you know, the, the, the Americans had the opportunity. We had the opportunity when we were there and instead were very passive and allowed um, the frustration because really, as, as my colleague has mentioned, in that last election, al-Maliki didn't win. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, for various reasons, pressures from Iran, the passivity of the Americans, he was able to form a government. And uh, unless his rule is replaced by a broader coalition, I don't see how the troubles are gonna end there. And in fact, they've accelerated. Mm -hmm. Al-Qaeda has gotten more and more confidence. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's operating on a, a, a stronger basis as mm -hmm. it had before 2008. So that's the problem. Okay. Well, the viewers, a short pause, and we'll look at Syria. Welcome back to Political Agenda. It's unfortunate that the world powers are doing nothing to stop bloodbath in Syria. The Syrian National Coalition has finally committed to attend the negotiations, all Geneva II. The ongoing crisis have left more than 120,000 killed 
as a result of violence. More than 4 million people have been displaced inside the borders, while more than 2 million Syrians have been forced to flee across borders, producing a humanitarian crisis in neighboring countries. Dr. Abdelaziz al Awishi, the Syrian conflict is becoming one of the worst in, in the century uh, so far. Uh, as a political observer, how do you read what is going on in Syria? And are we going to see a political solutions within Geneva too, with the uh, efforts of the international community? Certainly, everybody hopes that Geneva too will happen first mm -hmm. and that it will produce some positive results. And mm -hmm. I think there are many skeptics. Mm -hmm. uh, the Syrian regime so far has not conducted itself in a way that makes us confident that actually they will negotiate in good faith in Geneva. Uh, and so I think the responsibility remains with the international brokers, the United States, Russia, and others, to make sure that the Syrian government mm. uh, delivers uh, and that the, a, a mm. transition government is negotiated mm. uh, and, and that a, uh, a new government will be installed in Syria. But in the meantime, mm -hmm. I think as you pointed out, we are seeing uh, uh, the, the violence getting uh, more extreme than before. Mm -hmm. uh, the Syrian uh, army, the Syrian government seems to think that it has a free hand in dealing with the opposition. Mm -hmm. Uh, as long as it cooperated uh, on the dismantling of its chemical weapons. Mm -hmm. And so we saw that since the, the agreement to dismantle uh, their chemical weapons, they have intensified uh, bombing of civilian areas. They have uh, uh, strengthened their uh, siege over Homs, over uh, Halab, over uh, the uh, Damascus suburbs, almost every area where the opposition had a stronghold, and mm. I think their intent is obvious: is to uh, to eliminate as much of the opposition as possible before they go to Geneva. So there will be very little to negotiate, mm. Mm -hmm. uh, other than probably complete surrender, mm -hmm. or capitulation. And I think we to link this with with the, with the Iraq, the the two conflicts seem to feed on each other. Mm. Uh, before. Uh, Arab Spring, it was Syria, the Syrian government that was supporting, Allah helping mm -hmm. uh, terrorist groups go to Iraq uh, and, and playing you know, all sides in Iraq. And now we see the opposite. We see the Iraqis, the Iraqi government is sending fighters, irregular fighters, Shia militias. Uh, in but the uh, siding with the regime? With the regime, ah, yes, okay. yes, right. Mm -hmm. And also sending uh, Iraqi, uh, Iranian weapons. Uh, and uh, uh, mm. And of course, Iran itself is, is, is helping is involved, yes. the Syrian government both directly and through the it. airlift of, uh, of weapons to Syria and also through Hezbollah, Hezbollah fighters. And the revolutionary guys. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Aid Manna, sir, now Dr. al have just mentioned that the interference of Iran and Hezbollah in Syria is making the, uh, the conflict worse and harder to be solved because now it's becoming regional. How do you read the interference of uh, the Revolutionary Guard in Syria along with Hezbollah fighting with the regime against the people of Syria? Definitely Iran is uh, entertaining in, in Syria mm. and it's not hiding that. It mm -hmm. is also uh, always uh, uh, speak out that uh, they are supporting the Assad regime. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they are not the only one. Mm -hmm. There are others who are supporting the opposition. Uh, uh, Hezbollah uh, also fighting beside the Assad regime uh, because uh, it is uh, the Assad regime who created Hezbollah side by side with Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, and if the Syrian regime uh, overthrown, Hezbollah, Hezbollah will follow. And mm. Hezbollah doesn't want uh, to be uh, uh, dismissed from the, the, the map of the political uh, uh, scene. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, I think the, the hope for the Syrian is, is not that much clear. But uh, uh, probably Geneva too 
mm -hmm. might might bring them together together to talk to each other. Mm. No solution, unfortunately, for the Syrian uh, crisis other than the political solution. Now, the, the, the regime has in, uh, having the upper hand over the opposition uh, and winning in so many areas mm. uh, which uh, had been lost before. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it is only the political solution, uh, otherwise, the fighting will continue, and probably that what want, uh, the, the other, especially the, the, the Zionists, wanted Syria to mm -hmm. be distracted, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and that's uh, uh, not our uh, hope. Uh, we hope that uh, these uh, come together. Mm -hmm. uh, also, what uh, I agree with uh, Dr. al that what happened in Iraq is now being repeated in Syria, mm. but those who actually uh, uh, fighting in, in Syria, mm. they came from Iraq uh, and from Lebanon uh, for sectarian cause. Uh, also, it is the same, the same cause for those who are fighting uh, from the other Arab countries with the opposition who came to establish an Islamic State. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the, the West, and especially the Americans, why they actually refrain from uh, giving their uh, bold support uh, to, the, to, to the opposition, because they uh, know that most of these who are fighting mm. are belong to the uh, fundamentalist, and especially Al-Qaeda, and those who belong to Al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. And I think the American, the West, uh, also in our region, uh, nobody wants Al-Qaeda to have it as a state. Mm -hmm. And if we uh, notice what's happening in Libya, I we'll think- go, We'll go to Libya, Dr. Aid. I will go to Libya. We will discuss yeah. it in a few minutes. But uh, I was uh, concentrating on Syria. Dr. Schleifer said, 120,000 people dead, more than millions are displaced, Millions are homeless, refugees, name it. Why the whole uh, international community is, have not acted yet towards the Syrian regime in your point of view? I think because they're perplexed. You see, the opportunity was in the first year when fighting broke out, I mean, you know, it, it, what happened in Syria went through three phases. Initially, for the first month or two, mm. it was uh, nonviolent demonstrations in yes. the cities, and the response by the Syrian government was very violent, and uh, people were uh, shot, beaten up, arrested, and then uh, the, the, the protests turned to open rebellion, armed rebellion. You had defections from the Syrian army, you had uh, rebel forces springing up, uh, and so initially, it starts as a, a struggle for political freedom. And very quickly, it assumes sectarian, uh, sectarian terms because uh, the Assad regime itself is very much uh, the top, on the highest levels, very much represents mm -hmm. an offspring of, uh, they're not really Shia, but they're called Shia, and that's the Alawites, mm -hmm. and they rally other minorities. And on the other hand, the rebellion sort of crystallized as a Sunni rebellion. And now it's gone into a third phase Mm -hmm. which makes it even more dangerous because, you know, Syria, unlike other areas, for instance, you can't compare Syria to Li Libya. Libya is relatively isolated. I mean, but Syria touches on everybody. It touches on Lebanon, it touches on Jordan, it touches on Iraq. And what's happened is, and, and of course Turkey, and you've got these porous borders. So what's happened is, now it's becoming increasingly not a, a Syrian struggle, that went from a political struggle to a sectarian struggle mm -hmm. uh, between Sunni and Shia, but now it's becoming a regional struggle where you have people coming in. Of course, we know from the, uh, the, the, the Syrian army who's been tremendously reinforced in the last couple months, mm. um, uh, last six months, by the Hezbollah fighters who have taken a lead for the Syrian army, mm -hmm. um, and as well as, as has been mentioned, uh, other groups coming in through uh, from, from uh, uh, mm. Iraq. Mm. Uh, Shiite groups of Iraq. And at the same time, with every passing month, an increase in foreign fighters, uh, extremists, Sunni extremists, whether it's Al-Qaeda or uh, other branches of, of what we could call fundamentalists, 
coming in there, and not only just coming in, but assuming a very dynamic role, because some of them are seasoned fighters. So they, in both cases, the foreign element is becoming more and more predominant. Now the problem, I agree, uh, oh, so the question is why did this happen? Mm. Well, the, there's a thing called self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, six months into the crisis was a time when the United States could have intervened on side of, uh, and helped the re rebels because it was mm. clear that the, the initial cause was mm. a, a, a struggle for, against a, a, an oppressive regime and a struggle to bring uh, freedom to Syria. But instead, uh, President Obama was worried mm that if serious weaponry was serious amounts of weaponry was sent in to uh, help the rebels, uh, that it would fall into the hands of extremists, of um, militant Islamists or groups like Al-Qaeda. Mm. At that time, the presence of Al-Qaeda and other extremist elements were on the, in, in the rebel side were, very, were relatively small. Mm. But precisely because there wasn't an intervention at that time, and I don't mean American troops, I'm just talking about something that would have balanced out mm. what the Iranians were doing and the Russians were doing, you know, mm -hmm. backing the regime and sending them armaments, whatever. If there had been serious, uh, you know, bec because the, the, re the, the, the rebels initially did uh, take the initiative and, uh, were, you know, were, the uh, idea. were seizing control of the north, parts of the south, in the suburbs of Damascus, and if they had had serious weapons at the time, the chances of going into the hands of uh, extremists were very <laughs> slight. But precisely because there wasn't that intervention at that time, that assistance, mm. um, increasingly the, the elements within the, the rebel side, the, uh, which had weapons and had funding, which mm. was coming from sympathizers, unfortunately sympathizers throughout the Arab world, from the Sunni Arab world, who were mm -hmm. privately uh, uh, funding these extremist groups. They have come to have prestige and influence on the battlefield and politically. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems with Geneva II is, we know, all right, the Syrian National Coalition says they're ready to go, finally. Mm -hmm. But who does this, really, does the Syrian National Coalition, what do they represent, the fighters? One of the reasons why, there are two reasons why the Syrian government offensive has been very successful in the last couple months. One of them has been mentioned by my colleagues, the fact that that, that offensive has been largely led mm -hmm. by Hezbollah fighters, who are very you know, uh, committed fighters, mm -hmm. and as well as help from other outsiders. But there's another reason, and that's because the role of extremists have become s so big that they basically have been trying to take over the north, and there's been a lot of fighting in the last two months within the rebel side. Okay. And that fighting is such that, uh, that's, that's that again, provided a great opportunity for the Syrian government forces and with Hezbollah to advance into the northern areas, into oh. areas which have been under rebel control. Okay. So the question is, yes, the national coalition is going to mm. come, but who do they represent? Mm -hmm. And who, what, who leads the rebellion now? Is we'll it sum it up, we'll sum it, uh, Dr. Professor Schleifer, we'll sum it up in the, at the end of and the program. All, I will sum it up in the, at the end of the program because I need to, treat, uh, to speak about Yemen and the, uh, Libya and the rest, and Tunisia also. So we want, please, a shorter answer. The viewers, a short pause and we'll discuss Yemen. Welcome to the Political Agenda, and we're still discussing the outcome of the Arab Spring. In Yemen, following the 2011 uprising, the government has tried to enforce the national dialogue in order to reach an agreement about the number of regions for the north and south. In another development, Sa'da province is under siege from different...